how we should approach our ministry because John the Baptist had a role to play in the ministry of Christ. How should we approach our ministry? We have to have an attitude of serving Jesus when we are doing ministry. One of the things I've noticed is, in, in, you know, I just from experience is, and it's my personal experience, not just observing everybody else around me, but that our ministry is seriously affected if we serve out of our own ego. We need to be obedient to our calling. We need to give ourselves fully to serving Jesus. We need to be resilient when we serve God through our ministry. We need to be full of faith when we do that. But we also need to hold on to our ministry a little bit loosely just uh, in case Jesus calls you in a different direction. Okay? Because Jesus is the one who can direct you. And he may say, okay, this is for a season. Hold on to it loosely. When I call you somewhere else, you've got to let that go. And you've got to move. But it's your ego and your pride that may hold, or you know, your knuckles grip around something so tight that you can't let it go, and it could be because of pride or ego, you need to let go of that. So hold on to your calling, but hold on to it loosely in case Jesus calls you somewhere else. Now, I've been in ministry for well over 20 years now, and it's interesting that right throughout my ministry, God has given me an image that has gone with me right through every ministry that I've been in. And the image that I have that always every now and then pops into my head is of me standing in a, in a very dark room and dark, with dark church corridors, you know those big old cathedrals that you see in, particularly in Europe. Um, and I, I find myself just standing in those dark corridors with one of those brooms with um, the, you know, the straw brooms like the witches sit on, one of those brooms, and I'm just sweeping along the corridors all by myself. That's, that's the image that Christ has given me. I'm just quietly, no, there's no one around, just God has called me to sweep the floors of the church. And Jesus is there with me. And that is the image that I carry with me, and that's not for you, but it's for me, and it helps me to remember that, um, one, I'm not alone, even though I might seem like I'm alone, but I'm not alone. Jesus is with me. But it's also a reminder for me to be humble and to remember that my calling is to serve Christ but it has its limits as well. That's, that's what I get out of those, that picture of just sweeping the floors of the church. Now, it does, and now I've, I've had some wonderful experiences in ministry, and I can stand here all day and tell you all about the great stuff we've done and, and the amazing breakthroughs we've seen throughout just my ministry, but you know, you've all had the same thing but it always reminds me to remain humble. Just get back from all that limelight and just go back into the dark corridor where Christ is calling you to serve him, okay? We serve Jesus. That is what we are called to do. We called to serve Jesus. And in this passage, when we hear about John and how John is talking about about what's happening and what Jesus is doing on the other side, we learn just from John's word about his attitude to ministry. We see here John the Baptist's ministry is slowly sort of coming to a conclusion and Jesus's ministry is starting. And so there's a little bit of overlap going on where John was baptizing people. Now Jesus and his disciples are baptizing people as well. So there's a little bit of overlap going on here. Both people 
are baptizing. And what's happening now is more people are starting to follow Jesus. So John's disciples are now, well, what should we do? You know, those, you know there's more people going out there to, to follow Jesus. Now, if John was driven by his ego, he could start doing new things. He could start thinking about maybe he needs to expand his ministry from just preaching and baptizing and thinking, now as I'm talking about this, I want you to think about your church here as well, right? John could start thinking, oh no, there's more people going out there. What should we do? Maybe we should start a youth ministry. Maybe we should start a food bank. Maybe we should start doing more charity work. But he didn't do that. He was filled with joy that more people were going to Jesus' ministry because he knew what his calling was. He knew what God had called him to do and that his work was now slowly coming to an end and it's time for him to step aside. He was holding on to things loosely. He was serving Jesus in the backdrop of Jesus' authority and his supremacy. The scope of our ministry is determined by God. John said this, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. When you're serving God, always keep in mind what God is doing through your ministry. Everything that you have, all the gifts and talents that you have, is from God. Now, we can only work with what we have. And we can only give what we are given. But give everything you have for Jesus. This is what I like to call the gift of limitations and the limitations of our gifts. It's very, very important for us to remember that. The gifts of your limitation, sorry, the gift of limitation, that is actually a gift that God has given you. Remember the limitations of your gifts. It's for your benefit. It's for your benefit. Your limitations are for your benefit. And it's also for the glory of God. Because when you know where you are limited, you will start to trust in God more. If you think you're unlimited, you won't trust in God. You know, God always gives you just enough to keep you on your knees. Did you know that? But if you don't remember that, you'll never go down on your knees. You'll try and serve him on your own strength. So don't try and stand where God alone stands. Don't become like a God in your ministry. You are not the savior. Jesus is the savior. And John was very clear in his role. His role was to prepare the way for Jesus. Jesus had a role. John the Baptist had a role. I have a role here. You have a role here. So we should all rejoice in that. Rejoice in the role. Rejoice where God has put you. And they say you should grow where you are planted. And God has put you here. He's planted you here in this community. This church has been planted here. So we should grow where we are planted. I love this next illustration that John uses as he's trying to explain this to his disciples. He says this, it is the bridegroom who marries the bride and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. 
He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. See how John is just fading away into the background like the best man who just stands on the side while the wedding ceremony is taking place. John is filled with joy for Jesus and is also filled with joy just to be a part of that mission. And he uses this parable of a friend helping the bridegroom on the wedding day. And this is also very rich with the Jewish symbolism because God saw Israel as his bride, okay? And the church is the bride of Christ as well. We are in a relationship with God. The church is in a relationship with Christ. And our union with God is like a marriage. And John sees himself as the best man serving the groom. Now, one of the big prohibitions, and it goes without saying, is that the best man is not allowed to compete with the groom for the bride. Okay? And Christ is the bride. We are not to be in competition with Christ for his church or for the ministry. Now, I know some people here are studying the book of Judges in their Bible study group. So, yeah. You remember the story about Samson. You probably haven't arrived at that yet. But in Judges chapter 14, there's this story about Samson and this wedding that's about to take place. It's a great little story. And Samson makes a, a very expensive bet with 30 Philistine men. And he gives them a riddle to solve by the end of the, of the wedding ceremony or the, the wedding week, right? He gives them a few days to solve this riddle. And the riddle was all to do with, remember that lion that he killed earlier? He, he, he sets up a riddle about it because he knew nobody would get it right? because he did that in secret. Um, so he, he, he sets up this, this riddle for this, for these guys and um, as the week is sort of drawing to a close because the amount of money that was involved in that bet these 30 guys are really starting to get worried and they don't want to lose their money but at the same time they don't want to lose face either so what they do is they threaten his bride through the best man through Samson's best man they threaten the bride and the family. And they say, if you don't find you know, the answer to this, we're going to destroy you guys. So the best man and the bride, they, they talk about it. And then the bride goes to Samson and gets the answer out of him. And then they solve the riddle. And Samson is furious. He is furious that his bride-to-be has let the answer out. And Samson's response was this. You plowed, he's, he's saying it to the best man, you plowed with my heifer. <laughs> I love that line. That's gold. I sometimes call Miriam my heifer. <laughs> you plowed with my heifer. <laughs> Imagine calling your wife, your cow. But that's what Samson said, you plowed it. But he was furious. He was angry at the best man. You worked alongside my wife against me. And you know what Samson did after that. In his anger, he destroyed the Philistines. Later on, you read in that story, that best man ended up marrying that bride-to-be. You see, John the Baptist wasn't competing for Jesus with it or anyone else. He wasn't competing. His role was to unite people with Jesus. That was his mission, preparing people for the arrival of the Messiah. He's preparing the bride for the groom. And that's what we are called to do at the heart of our ministry. Everything that we do, at the heart of the church's ministry is to unite people with Jesus. 
whether it's through preaching, whether it's through teaching and leading Bible study groups, whether it's through the op shop, going out to teach scripture in the schools, serving the community, washing the feet of others, serving at the nursing homes, whatever it is that you're doing, don't just think of the practical stuff that you have to do. At the end of the day, we are called to serve and glorify Jesus. That's why John says he must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. Never make yourself the focus of your ministry. Never make the ministry itself the focus either. Make Jesus the focus. And people often follow charismatic leaders and preachers and they place these expectations on these leaders and they put them on a pedestal and what they're really doing is they're giving them something to fall off. And you see that in the book of Corinthians or the letter to the Corinthians where the church itself is being divided because they are arguing over who the best preacher is and who, you know, some people want to follow Paul, some want to follow Peter, some want to follow Apollos, and all these divisions are happening when they're all saying, no, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about serving Jesus. We're all preaching the same gospel. And we're all united under Christ and our mission is to go out into the world and lead people to Christ, to make disciples. Now, John had an amazing ministry. Jesus called him the greatest prophet. He had an amazing ministry, but he never made himself the focus of the ministry. He attracted a lot of attention. He attracted a lot of enemies as well. But he never made himself the focus. It was always about Jesus. And our mission and whatever we do in life loses its heart if it's not leading people to Jesus, if that's not our focus. It doesn't matter how gifted you are. It doesn't matter how well you do what you do. It doesn't matter how professional you are in what you do. If it's not about Jesus, you're missing the mark. It's got to be about Jesus. It's not about building your kingdom. It's about building God's kingdom. And everything belongs to Jesus. So serve Christ, but serve him under his authority and glorify him. And John goes on to say this. I won't say too much on this because I preached last week and it's sort of a repeat of what he said in you know, the John 3.16 section. And he says this, He has come from above and is greater than anyone else. We are of the earth and we speak of earthly things, but he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but how few believe what he tells them. Anyone who accepts his testimony can affirm that God is true, for he is sent by God. He speaks God's words, for God gives him the spirit without limit. The father loves his son and has put everything into his hands, and anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life but remains under God's angry judgment. Now I talked a lot about that last week so I won't say too much about that except to say make God's love personal. Make God's love personal. God wants a relationship with you and he wants you to lead others into a personal relationship with God. Jesus came from above. He is greater than anyone. He is supreme. He is the supreme authority over everything. And it's his kingdom that we serve. God's love and God's anger and judgment is both very personal. 
both very personal. It's relational. God doesn't just send lightning bolts from the sky and then go, oh, it's nothing personal, guys. Let me tell you, it's very personal. It is very personal because it's about our relationship with God. It is personal. Jesus said God came in love, for God so loved the world. He came in love, but people rejected him. Again, it's that repeat of John 3.16 here. This is his world. We are his bride. And he, he is supreme, and God wants people to live a certain way. So when we have trouble understanding God's judgment, we need to try and understand his love for humanity, his love for this world, and how he expects us to live in this world. It's his world, not our world. And the very fact that we reject God is a rejection of everything that God stands for in his love. That's why it's personal. It is very, very personal. And he expects us to live in love, not in sin. So let me just draw this to a conclusion. I know time's getting away a little bit this morning. But the scope of our ministry, I'll just finish with this. The scope of our ministry is determined by God as his spirit works with our obedience to him. Just remember, Jesus is interested in people, not in ministry. Okay? He's interested in people. So serve God to glorify him and serve God to bring others into a relationship with him. Be humble in how you serve. Hold on to things loosely. It's all about introducing people to Jesus. And often, you know, it's not about being in the limelight. It's not being the center of attention. Often, the most amazing things happen in ministry when no one sees it. When you are just serving God quietly and humbly, we don't, you know, get up and, and testify about it every Sunday and, and proclaim it out from here, out from the front every Sunday. It's the quiet little things you do every day in your conversations with people outside. That's where the Spirit of God is moving through you and helping you or, or, you know, God is using you to reach out and connect to other people through you in just that quiet corridor where you're just quietly sweeping and nobody is seeing you. So serve God. Whenever you go out, just remember you are serving God under the authority of Jesus Christ and you quietly and humbly just go out and live the way Christ wants you to live and I guarantee you the Holy Spirit is going to work through you in that. It's not about your ego, it's not about you. Just be humble and serve God faithfully and honor God with your life. Let's pray. I'll ask the, the musicians if they want to get ready for the next song as we pray. Lord God, we, we want to serve you, Lord. We want to serve you faithfully and, and glorify your name, Lord God. And Father, I pray, Lord, um, we'll, I just lift up this congregation to you and, and we present ourselves to you, Lord, this morning as your servants. We also present ourselves to you as your children. We stand before you as sinners who have been forgiven and have been washed in the blood of Christ. We thank you, Father God, for calling us into a relationship with you that you would see us as a beautiful bride, that you died for us, Lord God. So, Father, it's out of that thankfulness and out of our obedience to you, we want to serve you with everything that we've got. 
every gift and talent we've got, Lord. We want to serve you. Every ounce of energy that we have, even to our last breath, Lord God. As many of us here are, are uh, in the last season of their lives, and that's not to be negative in any way, Lord, but you have given us a wonderful life and you have given us the opportunity to serve you. And I pray, Lord God, that till our dying breath, we will serve you and glorify you wherever we go. That our lives will be um, just like an open vessel, Lord, where your, your Holy Spirit would just flow through us and that your love and your grace and your mercy would flow out through the way we live and, and give us the words to share, give us the opportunities to tell others about your love and how great and wonderful you are, Lord God. I pray, Lord, you would also rebuke us when we, when we serve out of pride and ego. I pray you forgive us as well, Lord God. Help us to be humble in how we serve. Help us not to judge others who are doing wonderful things out there. Help us to see the work of your Holy Spirit in all the churches and in all the other Christian ministries around us. And help us to join in that and celebrate just as John did us to see what you are doing in our local community and not judge other churches if they're growing and um, and they're doing great you know amazing new things that are reaching out to others help us not to judge them but to celebrate and pray for them as well that that may the work of their hands be blessed and um, be multiplied we well, thank you lord in jesus name Amen. Thank you, Farad. Our final song is one of Olivia's that she's written, Take My Life, Please Stand As We Sing. <laughs> <laughs>